This is a quote from a TED talk called Dangers of a Single Story by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. The dangers of a single story. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. Today I'm gonna to tell you a story about boys that both empowers and humanizes. It's a story that boys themselves have been telling me and my research team for over three decades. But before we listen to boys in my studies, I'm going to show you a brief preview of a film that tells you the story of boys that we tell in American culture. It's a story about masculinity. It's a story, as you will see, that dispossesses and maligns and has broken the dignity of a people. Stop crying. Stop with the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotions. Don't be a pussy. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. Always keep your mind. Nobody shit. likes a tattletale. Bros come before hoes. Don't let you women run your you life. You bitch. What a fag. Get laid. Do something. Be a man. Be a man. Grow some balls. The three most destructive words that every man receives when he's a boy is when he's told to be a man. We've constructed an idea of masculinity in the United States that doesn't give young boys a way to feel secure in their masculinity, so we make them go prove it all the time. Within their peer group culture, each of them is posturing based on how the other boys are posturing, and what they end up missing is what they each really want, which is just that closeness. In good times, guys are like really close to each other, but when things get a little bit worse, you're on your own. From middle school, I had four really close friends. Once I kind of went into high school, I struggle finding people I can talk to because I feel like I'm not supposed to get help. Our kids get up every morning. They have to prepare their mask for how they're going to walk to school. A lot of our students don't know how to take the mask off. What is it you don't let people see? Almost 90% of you have pain and anger on the back of that paper. If you never cry, then you have all these feelings stuffed up inside of you, and then you can't get them out. They really buy into the, a culture that doesn't value what we've feminized. If we're in a culture that doesn't value caring, doesn't value relationships, doesn't value empathy, you are going to have boys and girls, men and women, go crazy. I had anger issues in high school. I felt like an outcast. I've been suspended at least once every year I was here. We would just look for trouble and just like try to fight. Boys are more likely to act out. They're more likely to become aggressive. Most people miss that as depression or see it as a conduct disorder, or just a bad kid. I felt like just giving up on life. You know, I actually had suicide thoughts in my head at sixth grade. I felt alone for, for a long time, and I actually thought about killing myself. Whether it's homicidal violence or suicidal violence, people resort to such desperate behavior only when they are feeling shamed and humiliated or feel they would be if they didn't prove that they were real men. If you're told from day one, don't let nobody disrespect you, and this is the way you handle it as a man, respect is linked to violence. If I can man up, why well, step down from that, you feel me? It's like instinct. So man up. Man up. Man up. Man up. Man up. Some fucking ball. Act like a man. Be a man. Be a man. For my kids, I was going to end this hyper-masculine narrative here. I'm going to quote again uh, Adichie's talk, TED Talk, uh, but a different quote. The single story creates stereotypes, and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. With respect to boys, we have been telling a single story about them that is hurting them and us, and in some cases, killing them and us. The story is captured in the cliche that you all know, boys will be boys. Such a cliche suggests that boys are naturally less empathic, sensitive, vulnerable, and in need of close friendships than girls. We also believe that when boys act out, they are quote, unquote, rebels without a cause. 
rather than boys rebelling against a culture that doesn't listen. Such beliefs about boys are situated in an American culture that privileges all things stereotypically masculine over those deemed feminine. Thus, we privilege the self over relationships, independence over interdependence, the mind over the body, and thinking over feeling. We create selfies rather than we-fees. Self, we. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, you're going to be taking we-fees today, hopefully. Uh, and value our child's academic accomplishments over their social, emotional well-being. We not only privilege these stereotypically masculine qualities and capabilities, we demean and mock the ones we put on the bottom that are perceived to be, quote, unquote, girly and gay. American culture and its myths about boys has led to a crisis of connection among boys and young men in which they are increasingly disconnected from themselves and each other the consequences of which are, in the high, are seen in the high rates of loneliness, suicide, and violence among boys and young men. Yet, when my, uh, yet my research teams and I have listened to boys from early to late adolescence for the past three decades, and we've heard a very different story. In fact, we've heard a five-part story from boys. The five-part story, can you see that? Yeah. The five-part story uh, that I've heard from boys, you're going to hear it today, from boys themselves. The first part of the story that they tell us in their interviews is who they are as humans. Uh, and you'll hear about them in a second. The second part they tell us about is the clash between their nature and our culture. The third is the crisis of connection that comes out of that clash between their nature, our nature, of course, and culture. And then the consequences of that crisis. And finally, the solutions, which is going to be the focus of our panel today. So before we continue, let's, uh, this is the, the five-part story is told in this book, The Crisis of Connection. It's here at the conference. We're giving out free copies, by the way. Um, OK. I'm going, to tell, I'm going to tell this story through the story of boys' friendships, because that's how they tell the five-part story. And just so you know, I'm drawing almost extensively, almost exclusively, sorry, uh, from my book, Deep Secrets, Boys, Friendships, and the Crisis of Connection. So let's begin. And one of the things I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be having people at different tables reading quotes from the boys. So I will, when, once we get that started, I'll name the number of the quote, and then the person assigned to that quote will get up and read the quote. Uh, so let's begin. It is the middle of June, and the New York City heat is on full blast, making it even hotter in the empty high school classroom where 15-year-old Justin and his interviewer, Jose, sit in the late afternoon. Justin is being interviewed for the second time for our school-based research project on boys' social and emotional development. The first set of questions is about Justin's friends, and he responds by discussing his network of peers in school. Turning to the topic of close friendships, he says, my best friend and I love each other. That's it. You have this thing that is deep. So deep it's within you, you can't explain it. It's just a thing that you know that that person is that person, and that is all that should be important in our friendship. I guess in life, sometimes two people can really, really understand each other and really have a trust, respect, and love for each other. It just happens. It's human nature. Listening to boys, particularly during early and middle adolescence, speak about their male friendships is like reading an old-fashioned romance novel where the pro female protagonist is describing her passionate feelings for her man. At the edge of manhood, when pressures to conform to gender expectations intensify, boys speak about their male friends or wanting male friends with abandon, referring to them as people whom they love. 85% of the hundreds of boys we've interviewed throughout adolescence for the past 30 years suggest that their closest friendships, especially those during early and middle adolescence, share the plot of love story more than the plot of the Lord of the Flies. Boys from different walks of life greatly valued their male friendships and saw them as critical components to their emotional well-being, not because their friends were worthy opponents in the competition for manhood, but because they were able to share their thoughts and feelings, their deepest secrets with these friends. When you listen to boys talk about their friendships from early to late adolescence, you hear three themes. The first theme is shared secrets. And now I'm going to have people read quotes. Matt, why don't you start with, slide, uh, with uh, quote number two. Hector says at the age of 14, go ahead. I've got two best friends, Willie and Brian. 
Like sometimes when me and Willie argue, me and Brian are real close. Then when me and Brian are not doing so good, me and Willie are real close. It's like circles of love. Sometimes we're all close. Lily, uh, go ahead. Raphael says at the age of 15, I want you to pay attention to the ages uh, when I say them. Raphael at the age of 15 says, my ideal best friend is a close, close friend who I could say anything to. Because sometimes you need to spill your heart out to somebody and there's nobody there. And if there's nobody there, then you're gonna keep it inside. Then you will have anger. So you need somebody to talk to always. Paul says at the age of 15, Ashanti, go ahead. We are real close. Nothing could get in between us. Like if I disagree, he'll know why I'm disagreeing. Not just because I'm disagreeing. He'll be up to my level. He knows what I'm about, like he knows. Like even sometimes when I sit at home, he knows what I'm thinking. Like we already know each other. Like if we came out of the same bellies. Michael says in his freshman year, quote number five. My best friend could just tell me anything and I could tell him anything. Like I always know everything about him. We always chill like we don't hide secrets from each other. We tell each other our problems. When asked to explain why he feels close to his best friend, Kevin says, quote number six. If I'm having problems at home, they'll like counsel me. I just trust them with anything, like deep secrets, anything. Carlos, a sophomore, says, quote number seven. It's like a bond. We keep secrets. Like if there is something that's important to me, like I could tell him and he won't go and make fun of it. Like if my family is having problems or something. While boys spoke about loving to play basketball or video games with their friends, the emphasis was always on talking together and sharing secrets with their best friends and, and was how boys defined a best friend. And betrayal of this confidence was the primary cause of, get, of, of terminating a close friendship. Boys indicated that the intimacy or the sharing of secrets in their friendships is what they like most about the friendship. In his junior year, Alessandro says, quote number eight. What I like most about my best friendship is the connection. It's like, you know how you know somebody for so long, you could talk about anything, and you won't even think, oh, what are they thinking? You just talk. MJ says what he likes most about his friend is, quote number nine. Yeah, because my best friend is like a second person you could speak to. It's like, see how the kids carry a little teddy bear or whatever, and when they cry, they'll hold it and stuff. So when like you get upset or something, you just walk over to your closest friends and they'll loosen, they'll loosen up whatever. They'll be like, yeah, it's all right, even though it's not. So interesting, MJ recognizes both the safety that a friend provides, but also the way boys cover over and tell stories that they know aren't true. The content of boys' secrets varied considerably, and the term secrets was often used interchangeably with problems. Problems were always secrets, but secrets weren't necessarily problems. Andy said, makes distinctions between secrets when talking about the friends whom he doesn't trust and the friends he does. Quote number 10. I mean, I can like joke around with my friends who are not close. And like if I'm having trouble in my classes, like if someone knows the subject better than me, like I'll ask them. Like, yeah, it's pretty much like that. Not too deep though. I wouldn't tell them my two secretest things. Not too secretive. Yeah, like about a girl or something. <laughs> I mean, that's the deepest. Nothing deeper than that though. With my best friends, I will tell my deepest secrets. The content of regular or not too deep secrets range from crushes on girls to girl related topics. Really, really big secrets or secretest things were almost always related to conflict in the home or on occasion coping with disabilities or drug abuse of a family member. Ethan admits that it's good to have a best friend because quote, sometimes like you don't wanna tell your family members because it's probably about them and you just tell your friend and they'll keep a secret and help you. The second theme that we hear when listening to boys talk about friendships is they make explicitly the link, and this is so important for this audience, they make explicitly the link between having friendships and mental health. 
Boys not only had intimate friendships and wanted them if they didn't have them, but they believed that this intimacy is essential for their health and well-being. Stephen says in his freshman year, and now I, what I'd like you to do is just listen to the quote without seeing it written up there. So I'm going to read them and just get into the voices of boys. Stephen says in his freshman year, you need friends to talk to sometimes. You know, like you have nobody to talk to, you don't have a friend, it's hard. You gotta keep things bottled up inside. You might just start crying or whatever. Like if a family member is beating on you or something and you can't tell a friend, you might just go out, just you know, do drugs, sell drugs, whatever. Alan says in his junior year that he needs, quote, someone to talk to, like you have problems with something. You go talk to him. You know, if you keep it all to yourself, you go crazy. Try to take it out on someone else. Another boy concurs, saying that without friends, you will go crazy or mad, or you'd be lonely all the time, be depressed. You'd go wacko. Kai says bluntly at the age of 14, quote, my friendships are important because you need a friend or else you'd be depressed, you won't be happy, you'd try to kill yourself because then you'd be all alone and no one to talk. When asked what it would be like if you had no one to talk to, Lee says, then it's like I always think like bad stuff in my brain because like no one's helping me and I just need to keep it all, all my secrets to myself. The third theme that we heard, third and final theme, is the crisis of connection, which you begin to hear as boys move transition into middle to late adolescence. As boys enter late adolescence, however, they do begin to sound more like masculine stereotypes. They begin to talk less and rarely speak about love when it comes to their male friendships. They also start using the phrase, and they still use this phrase in case anyone thinks that this is outdated, it's not. Uh, no homo, following intimate statements about their friends and tell us that they don't have time for their male friendships, even though they continue to express strong desires for having such friendships. They begin to say such things as, quote, it might be nice to be a girl, because then you wouldn't have to be emotionless. In response to a simple question regarding how their friendships have changed since, since, uh, since they were a freshman, Justin describes how his friendships, sorry, Justin describes in his senior year how his friendships have changed since he was a freshman. And Justin, you heard in that very first quote about human nature, I'm gonna read you four years later, the same kid. When asked about his friendships, he says, I don't know, maybe not a lot, but I guess the best friends become close friends. So that's basically the only thing that's changed. It's like best friends become close friends, close friends become general friends, and then general friends become acquaintances. So they just, if there's a distance, whether it's I don't know, natural or whatever. You can say that, but it just happens that way. Michael says, like my, my friendship with my best friend is fading, but I'm saying it's still there. But so, I mean, it's still like, cause we still do stuff together, but only once in a while. It's sad, cause he lives only one block away from me and I get to do stuff with him less than I get to do stuff with other people who are like way further. It's like, I it's like a DJ used his crossfader and started fading it slowly and slowly. And now I'm like halfway through the crossfade. Hector says, do you, when asked, do you have a closer best friend this year? Hector says, not really, I think myself. The friend I had, I lost it. That was the only person I could trust and we talked about everything. And when I was down, he used to help me feel better. The same I did to him. So I feel pretty lonely and sometimes depressed because I think that, that it will never be the same, you know. I think that when you have a real friend and you lost it, I don't think you find another one like him. That's the point of view I have. I tried to look for a person you know, but it's not that easy. Late adolescence for the boys in my studies is a time of disconnection from the relationships that they hold so close to their hearts. Rather than simply being a period of progress, adolescence for these boys is also a period of loss. As their bodies are almost fully grown and their minds are increasingly attuned to cultural messages about manhood and maturity, boys begin to distance themselves from the very relationships that they relied on previously so they wouldn't go wacko. Boys know by late adolescence that their close male friendships and even their emotional acuity put them at risk of being labeled girly, immature, or gay. Thus, rather than focusing on who they are, they become obsessed with who they are not. They are not girls, little boys, nor in the case of heterosexual boys are they gay. In response to a cultural context that links intimacy and male friendships with an age, a sex, female, 
and a sexuality gay. These boys mature into men who are autonomous, emotionally stoic, and oftentimes isolated. The ages of 16 to 19, however, are not only a period of disconnection for the boys in my studies, it is also a period in which the suicide rate for boys in the United States rises dramatically and is the age at which many of the mass shootings have occurred across the country. So just as boys predicted, not having friends to share their deepest secrets makes them go wacko. So the solutions to the crisis lie in reimagining boys for who they are rather than how we stereotype them to be. Once we reimagine them as needing friendships as much as all other humans, and as being as sensitive, empathic, and as vulnerable as all other humans, and we see that they are both thinkers and feelers and have minds and bodies, we free them to see their own humanity as well as the humanity of others. Thank you. We're now gonna to turn to our panel uh, to talk about the solutions to the crisis of connection and how in their own work they're fostering connection. Uh, our panel has, uh, first of all, Dr. Matt Angler Carlson, please come to the stage, Lily Howard Scott, and Ashanti Branch. Okay, we're gonna start with a question from Matt. Actually, we're gonna do introductions first. Sure. Matt, why don't, you, <laughs> why don't you introduce yourself first, Matt, and then Lily, and then Ashanti. Okay, great. Um, I am a professor at Cal State University Fullerton, and I'm also the director of the Center for Boys and Men. Um, I'm also a former K-8 school counselor in Salem, Pennsylvania, and California. And for the past two decades, um, I really focused on the mental health of men, initially trying to understand kind of why boys and men do what they do, and then eventually begin to think about kind of how they seek help. And one of the things that we certainly know is that men and boys seek help at a much lower rate. And I began to be interested in this idea of kind of if boys actually make this, this courageous attempt to seek help, are there people on, on the other end who actually understand how to help them? I spent a lot of my time working with allied helping professionals, whether it's school counselors, school psychologists, psychologists, social workers, nurses, MDs, anyone who will listen to me honestly, um, to, to talk a bit about about how we help boys and men in, in, in effective ways. Um, I also really write about positive masculinity. Um, so if you think about, in the media right now, we talk a lot about toxic masculinity, which is a term that's been around since the mid-70s. But you might find it hard to believe that the, that the term positive masculinity has only been around since about 2008. Um, and so again, I'm really interested in thinking about moving forward and what's actually healthy. Um, I do a lot of relational work with men I, and, and boys. I know if I get them in a room and together, um, I know great things will happen. Because um, I know that, that boys and men crave close connection. Um, and, and most recently, I worked on uh, the American Psychological Association's guidelines for psychological practice for boys and men. Okay, thank you, yeah. thank you very much, Matt. Lily? Good morning, all. I'm Lily. Um, and it's just so special to be here with all of you who believe deeply in the value of social and emotional learning. Um, I am a third grade teacher and a curriculum developer based in Washington, DC. And my greatest priority as an educator is helping uh, children learn how to connect with themselves and how to connect with one another. And I attempt to do this by weaving a focus on emotional literacy. In other words, you know, the ability to name, manage, express emotions, to empathize with the emotional experiences of others. I, I try to weave this work into the academic curriculum. I believe that they can have a symbiotic relationship and really go hand in hand. And, you know, I also believe that in an increasingly diverse and collaborative world in which we need to study and work alongside those um, who are not like us and who we might be tempted to otherize, it is more important than ever that we empower teachers with the permission and the professional development to help children learn how to navigate their inner lives and share about their inner lives uh, so that they discover that truth, which many of us grown-ups are still grappling with, um, you know, the notion that what we think alienates us from one another, our vulnerabilities, our insecurities, it's really all that that connects us most deeply to each other. 
um, and children who understand that and who celebrate all that they have in common, um, who can normalize naming and managing their anxieties. They operate with resilience and empathy, and they are you know, compassionate souls and natural leaders. And I, I have found in my experience working with eight and nine-year-old boys that they are um, so ready to operate that way. They are itching to talk about their feelings. They are itching to connect with one another. And getting into that habit very early on um, can work wonders for them now and uh, work wonders for the, the men who they grow up to be and work wonders for the rest of us who, who work with them and who, uh, who care, with, care for them. Thank you. Ashanti. Good morning. You know, uh, my name is Ashanti Branch. I'm from Oakland, California. Uh, I was, uh, my story began raised by a single mother on welfare, and I had no father growing up. So I had to learn masculinity from a mother who did her best, who didn't know how to be a man, but tried to teach me how, and then from people in the streets who said, here's what the rules are of being a man. And sometimes there were a lot of conflicts. Um, when I became an educator, I started off as an engineer. Um, I never wanted to be a teacher, because teachers don't make money. And, um, <laughs> I grew up poor, so I was like, I'm not going back there again. Um, but when I became a teacher, teaching called me. And the first year of teaching, I was failing. I was doing a horrible job with young men who were smart, who were sitting in my classroom every day. And I was like, why are you failing my class? Like, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm, I'm not here for this check, you know? Um, and what I learned from those young men was that, you know, school and the community that I grew up in or that I was teaching in, school's not cool. And so if you want to be cool and you're a young man, then you're going to act in ways that are cool. And if, doing your homework and listening to the teacher are not cool qualities, you may not use those qualities. And so what we, in Ever Forward, what we, well, I started with lunch. I said, look, I'll buy you lunch once a week. In exchange for lunch, you teach me how to be a better teacher. Like, tell me what I'm doing wrong, because I think I'm smart, and I can tell you're smart, but we're creating failure. Like, you're failing my class. And those lunch meetings just began a place where students began to talk about, I'm not going to care about no heavy old backpack. I'm not going to be sitting here, being no geek, no nerd, no teacher's pet. And I was like, but how are you going to graduate, you know? And so we began to build this program where young people just talked about what they were going through. And a lot of the challenges they were having wasn't academic. It was all the other stuff that was in the way before they even thought about academics. So they, they came to school to escape sometimes a life that was just not so positive. But what they got to do whenever forward is to recognize that the other young men were also going through stuff and they got a space to talk about it. And when we gave them a space to just kind of get real, then we began to help them break down the walls of how they were gonna achieve the goals they had. And so that's the work that we got to do, and so what we've been doing uh, for the last uh, 15 years. Great, oh, wonderful, okay. A lot of good work on this stage. Okay, um, so we're gonna start with Matt, and my question for you initially is, uh, so what are some of the takeaways, uh, if you could talk about the APA guidelines sure. um, that really transformed uh, how we think about boys and men and what you added, you and your colleagues. So if you can talk about the APA guidelines and the takeaways from the APA guidelines in terms of fostering connection. Absolutely. Um, I think on the slide you'll see them in a second. Um, so this is, is a policy document that came out last year and uh, that really was probably the first time that, that a national organization um, went out and really talked about the health of boys and men and saying here are the things that we actually know and here are things that we know actually help. Policy documents are not terribly exciting. Um, APA has lots of guidelines that have come out. Um, I will tell you that these guidelines took 14 years to write. Um, and outside of my marriage and my son, it's the longest project I've ever had. Um, and I'm often asked, why 14 years? And let me put it this way. This project started in 2004. And think about how we were talking about gender in 2004. And now think about how we talk about gender now. Because gender is a concept that's constantly changing and flowing based on society's expectations. And if you're going to write a policy document, it has to be one that's actually useful, that actually people who are in practice, who are sitting with boys, um, are going to have the right terminology to reach them. So in terms of, of this document, what it really is, it reviews over 40 years of empirical research, over 200 citations, um, really noticing health disparities for boys and men. Um, and then looking at kind of ways to create solutions. Um, and one of the solutions, of course, is that we have to find ways to foster connection um, in boyhood and 
And if we don't, we end up having men who find themselves isolated without a social support or contact. And we know how important that is, because uh, so the health data looks at that if you want to be healthy, you have to have contact with people in your life. Um, yeah. So I, I wonder if you could tell us uh, two things. So yeah. one is, tell us how a policy document yeah. is linked to fostering connection. Yeah. Uh, because I think it is, and I think you do too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the second thing that I definitely want you to address is you told us yesterday that you, when that policy statement came out, that you actually received death threats from people and the, just sort of the negative response to when you try to change the culture in this way. Yeah, yeah, so there's, there's two questions here. In terms of this idea around policy, we know that policy drives current thinking and dialogue. So if you have a statement that comes out and says, this is what we actually know, um, and here are actual solutions, um, you know, those of us who want to help people need to kind of look at those ideas and figure out how we can move forward. And the thing about that I think that is really important is it clearly states this policy that you know, we need, need to create connection in places where boys feel heard. And I think we know that, and I think we've known this for a long time. I think we've known that there are health disparities, like the suicide rate, like we've known that for a long time. We know that for the most part, men, men tend, tend to die from suicide at a four to one ratio. Um, and yet I also think we've known that for a long time, and yet somehow that became okay because there wasn't much done about it. But now when we get and look at the research again, it's like this is not okay. So we can actually begin to think what are the actual solutions. So the policy, I think, again, gives you information that kind of says this is an important topic that schools can address. It is a part of SEL is absolutely part of SEL because if you look at kind of yeah. dropout rates and things like that, we know that our young men and boys need help. In terms of thinking about the controversy the around, the pushback yeah. around that. Yeah, I mean, because I, I think we oftentimes, those of us who do this work, don't address that enough. Yeah, yeah. It's just the, the amount of uh, incredibly aggressive pushback yeah, you get yeah. from when you start to reimagine uh, boys. Yeah, it's an interesting kind of dilemma because like I said, a policy document is not terribly exciting. Yeah. And this appeared on a website uh, for months and no one cared about it. And you can actually download this anytime you'd like. Um, but what ended up happening was there, there was a Twitter kind of feed that went out from the APA that, that was somewhat incorrect um, that said, APA says traditional masculinity is bad for your health, which is not what the document said. Uh, the document actually said that the data suggests that women over conform to stereotypes and essentially adopt those in a very restrictive way. We know that there's a variety of health concerns that flow from that. I can say that unequivocally. It's very, very clear. Um, but that's context, and, and that got lost. And so this got thrown into our current debate in politics with the left and the right. And the same time, there's an ad uh, from Gillette that came out that also made a really clear statement about this. And so what ended up happening was, like I said, gender is political, uh, whether you know it or not, that there's a huge defense to kind of push back against traditional norms and to protect them and say, you know, you're saying that men are bad. And the reality is that's not what we're, we're saying. So uh, in, in just a couple yeah, seconds. Yeah, I'll say real quick. Could you, so, could you just tell us what, then how should we respond as those of us doing that work and promoting these messages? Yeah. What, I, what would you give us? I'm, I think the biggest thing to think about is that we have to begin to understand boys ourselves, mm -hmm. that we have to begin to look at our own stereotypes that we have about uh, the men and boys in our life. And then when we enter into settings where we, we encourage boys and meet boys, we have to kind of understand who they are. They're not men. They're boys. Right? And they're looking for connection. So the stereotype says that maybe they're not. Or, and they may show you a uh, type of behaviors that, that's a pushback, that they're not interested. But in, in a way, that's kind of a farce, right? Because inside, there's something very, very different. And I, and I know Ashanti is going to talk about this, that what you see on the outside is not what's happening on the inside. Exactly. exactly. Um, very clear. OK, thank you so much, Matt. Um, Lily. Um, OK, so the first question is, in your Washington Post article, excuse me, <clears throat> in your Washington Post article, which I loved, about emotional literacy in boys, you discussed the ways you found that boys in your elementary classroom were eager to discuss their emotions and surprised to learn that the feelings they assumed were uniquely theirs were in fact universal. So I'm wondering, and of course that is consistent with the findings we have too, um, can you share an example of, of that happening? And also, it's really, I would love to hear from you how you think that sort of recognition that I'm actually normal, mm -hmm. and this is normal, um, builds connections. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think of a very special group of, of third graders who I learned so much from. Um, primarily that, that one student's bravery can trigger an avalanche of vulnerable sharing um, from peers. The elementary school teachers in the audience might be familiar with a particular author, Patricia Polacco, who um, writes books about her learning variation, about being dyslexic. And I recall a young girl, um, after, after we read aloud a couple of Patricia Polacco books, said that she wanted to share with the class about her dyslexia and about the assumptions that she thinks other people make about her. She wanted to share about the strengths associated with dyslexia, that she can think outside the box, she's a creative person. And her share inspired a little boy, Max, who wrote a poem called Disabled, to ask me if he could share with the class about um, his struggles to see and about how just because he, he has difficulty um, seeing things clearly, you know, that, as he says, that doesn't mean that he's never been a good student. And it was Max's share that really um, inspired so many other boys to be deeply vulnerable and, and open up themselves. We, um, uh, I facilitated this sharing protocol, or rather a feedback protocol, while Max was sharing his poem. And all the students wrote down notes of encouragement and connection on these little pieces of paper. And I stapled them together. Um, and it, it became a sort of book of support for, for Max to always hold on to. And what the boys wrote was pretty remarkable. One boy wrote uh, him, I never knew that people bullied you just because you're disabled. P.S. I am disabled. <laughs> um, another boy said, I have glasses too and I agree totally. I love my glasses and it's a gift. Another boy said, I love how you show that you're actually not weak at all. And before long, so many students were itching to share about elements of their inner lives that had previously remained hidden. And so I designed this map called an outer shell and um, outer, outer shell inner swirls map, where the students wrote around the outline of a figure what they project to the world, what's obvious about them. And on the inside, they jotted down their swirls, their idiosyncrasies and longings and worries, and when they shared these maps with one another, they were astounded by all that they had in common. And, you know, it's, I think it's important to note that um, it wasn't just students who struggle who really connected with this work. Quinn, whose poem is also projected, you know, an extremely, extremely bright boy, a popular boy, a hardworking boy, um, he, he wanted his peers to understand his identity in a more full way. You know, yes, he is smart, but he's also silly, and sometimes he feels like uh, he is not truly known. And, and speaking of feeling known, this work just reminded me that all students crave feeling known. And when you provide a space for them to feel known, um, they, they are forced to sort of interrupt that myth of otherness, and they are forced to connect with with one another in a way that is so lovely because, because they're pipsqueaks, you know, they're not paralyzed by self-consciousness yet. They haven't yet learned how to wear masks for the most part. Yeah. And that openness at this very tender age um, is quite beautiful to behold. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if there's, uh, I mean, it's, it's something interesting to me about the expression not only gets other people to express, but to actually connect, yeah. you know, to become curious about who you are because yeah. I didn't know that about you if that resonates at all with your own work. Oh, absolutely. Um, we use the Emily Stiles framework of windows and mirrors. Um, some educators in this room might be familiar with that, the idea that we all have mirrors to one another. We, we, we see ourselves in each other, but we also um, see windows in the experiences of others. And we are surprised sometimes that someone's experience that we might have thought might be like ours is not at all. And the children shared their maps and they marked their window connection or their their mirror connections and their windows. And it was, um, it was really special to, to watch them sort of, as I said earlier, reframe the narratives they had been telling about one another. Mm. Oh, thank you. And on the, uh, my other question, my final question is, um, there's, you know, in most classroom settings, social emotional learning is, tends to be siphoned off from the academic curriculum. Yes. Um, and we've worked really hard in the listening project, which I'll talk about shortly, to make it a part of the everyday yeah. curriculum so it's not seen as, a, as tangential to learning. And I know that everybody agrees with us here. Uh, but I'm curious on your thoughts, if you could just oh, add yeah. how you've done that. And I mean, we teachers cannot handle one more curriculum that is handed to us. Yeah. Um, 
and I'm sure many in this room can relate to us. And I think this work is so much more powerful when it's, it's all blended together. And so I think particularly when it comes to language arts instruction, there are just so many ways um, to foster introspection, um, introspection and, and vulnerability. Um, you know, analyzing characters deeply helps us analyze ourselves. Writing about experiences or emotions that are complicated helps us better understand them. So, so how can you do this? Well, um, if you have a reading workshop in your class, you might design a, a reading response for students in their reader's notebook that um, asks them to sort of track the internal emotional journey of a character, and that helps children develop their own emotional vocabulary. I love to do something called spotlighting during read-alouds where I point to a student and he or she embodies a character in a moment of tension and um, sort of shares an improvised in interior monologue, which of course helps that child exercise the muscle of imagining somebody else's experience. Um, there are personal narrative brainstorming strategies that help students reflect on moments when they felt conflicting emotions. Um, there are also, you know, feedback protocols like those booklets of support that really give students um, the ability to feel totally seen and totally loved by their peers. And these um, are not necessarily lessons, they're just things that teachers can, can weave into the wonderful work that they're already doing. Um, and so, uh, I'm working on compiling those resources. I hope they will be helpful. And I think the final thing I want to say is that, you know, this work actually enhances academic achievement. If you have an administrator who is very, <laughs> who is very nervous about test scores, you know, um, students who are resilient, who are self-aware, who can manage their own anxieties, they are much, uh, you know, they don't give up when the going gets tough. Um, students who understand themselves understand understand literature in a more sophisticated way. They're, they're, this work, um, it really helps students be become stronger thinkers. Yeah, I mean, I've always been noting in my own work with kids that when, and it's true for me too, that when you feel seen, yeah. uh, that opens up your mind. Uh, oh, completely. Because ultimately, you know, I, we have a phrase in our project called thick love. So when mm. you're thickly loved, meaning that you're seen by your teacher or your friends, right. um, all of a sudden you can think better, you can think more clearly. Oh my gosh, you're not spending all that yeah. energy trying yeah. to hold it together and, yeah. and pretend. Yeah, exactly. And I have yeah. noticed that it, in, in my classrooms, uh, particularly students who have been holding it together for many years, particularly students with learning variations, when they feel seen and accepted, their academic achievement just soars because yeah. they're able to take risks and to throw themselves into work that they had previously been holding themselves back from. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Lily, very much. Um, okay, Ashanti. So the first question is, how does the work that Ever Forward, how does it support schools to create safe spaces for young men to build connections? And I know you've launched a campaign called the 100,000 Mass Challenge, which of course we want to hear about. And I'm curious about specifically how that campaign and your work more generally helps men Sort of, I want the stories. How, how does it help men, young men, connect to each other? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, can we all take a deep breath? Can we all take a deep breath? You know, for me, uh, the incoming breath helps energize the body, and the outgoing breath helps relax the body. You know, when I tell young men we're going to take some breath, some breaths, um, I don't want to make it too complicated for them. And so, what we're trying to do in Ever Forward is give a space for students and young men to talk about what they're going through and not need to be fixed. Like I, I think sometimes um, what I, when I, as a teacher, I would say teachers didn't want to talk to students about what they were going through because they didn't want to have to try and have to fix the problems. And I didn't think that my program was about trying to fix their problems. I was just wanting them to have a space they could go and talk about what they were going through in a healthy way. And then what do you want to do about it? Do you want help on it? Do you just want to let it vent about it? Do you want advice about it? Like what, what, where, what's the next action you want to take? Because it's your life. And what we do in Ever Forward is giving those young men a space to be able to take off their mask in a way to say, look, you're okay here. You're safe here. I wish society had a space for young men to be able to feel wherever they were, to be able to emote, to cry, to be whatever emotion that they needed to feel. But unfortunately, society doesn't let our young men cry without something being wrong with them. Now, maybe your community does, but the community I grew up in, if a young man is crying, there's something wrong. 
with him. Not what he's going through. There's something wrong with him because boys in the community where I live are not supposed to cry. You're not supposed to feel. And so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just tell you about my mask first. And I think that's the easiest way for me to, like, uh, let you understand how it works. So um, the mask is what I, like, let people see about me. And so the front of the mask, like, what I let people see, I try and let people see that I'm hardworking, um, that I'm serious, and sometimes I try and be funny. And not at the expense of others, but just to make people laugh. And the things I don't talk about, the things I don't usually let people see, is that um, I have an extreme fear of failure. Like a huge fear of failure. I have a huge father wound. My father died before I was born, and I miss him all the time. I wish I could get over it. And as a child, I was abused in lots of ways. Oftentimes, I don't have places to talk about that. So I talk about being hardworking and how hard I work. I'm, I'm, I'm going to introduce you to two young men who I met yesterday. And on the tables on the front of you, there's some cards when you can make your own mask. Actually, I invite you to, at some point between now, between now and you leave, to make your own mask. But I'm going to introduce you to two young men. This one young man said, um, these are the things I show the world, the front of the mask. It says, funny, easygoing to an extent, and intelligent. And the back, he said, impatient, stressed, and confused 24-7. This is a 16-year-old boy here in Chicago. And this other young man, which uh, you'll find interesting, his mask looks very different, um, but this is what he says on the front. This is what I show the world. I'm a jokester, funny guy, the bad one, evil and rude, always in trouble. And on the back, the things that he doesn't let people see, philosophical, artistic, poetic, creative. So imagine that there's people who show one thing and there's other things going on. Maybe you yourself know about your own mask. Maybe you haven't explored it. Um, I definitely encourage you to do that. But what we, what we be able to see, what we're able to see with young men all over the country and definitely different parts of the world through the masks is that um, I think we're more alike than we are different. We have more in common than we, we really recognize. That there's so much more going on to us than people could ever know just by looking at us. And with our boys, when they know that people won't accept their poetic, artistic side, then they show up as rude and angry and the bad one and the one who's always in trouble. Or they just do what you want them to do. They acquiesce to being kind and nice and funny and easygoing when deep down they're dealing with some sadness and fear and other things in their life that they don't get to talk about. I think we use our masks. I don't think masks are bad. I don't tell people masks are bad. But I know our young men use them to, for protection, for safety, for fitting in. And I think the work that we've been trying to do with the mask is really, how do we give young men a space that they can say, I'm, I'm OK. And if I'm not OK, do I have other people I can talk to about it and I don't have to pretend that I, that I am all the time? Yeah. 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 Can, can, I want to ask you a question. So. Um, it's also struck me watching you and knowing your work so well and in my own classrooms too, is how easy sometimes when you create a safe space for boys and young men to take off that mask. And people always say, well, you know, even when they hear these quotes from my research, they say, how do you get boys to talk like that? Girls have said that, teenage girls says, how do you get boys to talk like that? Um, but, and I always say, we just ask the question. Um, and by asking the question, we create a safe space. We said, tell me about your friendships. And nobody had ever asked them about their friendships. So I'm curious about if you could reflect in your own work of, in some sense, you seeing the same thing, that it's once you create the safe space, then what happens? Yeah. I mean, I, they, they, they will tell you. I mean, I think these was yesterday. I did the same thing with the, I asked them, write three steps. Draw a mask, write the three words on the front, what you yeah. let people see and three words on the back of the things you don't let people see. Now, I started off by telling them a story of mine. I told them about myself. I wanted them to know that I'm human. I'm not, I wasn't standing in front of them as an expert on anything. I'm, a, I'm, I'm standing in front of you as a, as a man who was a boy who was trying to figure out what it meant to be a man, and there was no man around teaching me. And even though I had my grandfather around and other men around, they were telling me about other stuff that I didn't want to talk about. You know, and so when you ask them, when you give them permission to speak, now these are anonymous, right? So they get a chance to speak it by writing it. And what you saw in the documentary, that was the first time we'd ever done it. I even gave them a mask. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just trying something out. 
I gave them their, their mask. And only after it, you know, evolving the program after a couple of years, we said, well, draw your own mask. What mask? And I don't care what you draw. It's not about the drawing. It's just about the activity, about like, I'm gonna willing to do your best. If you could just give them opportunity to do their best. And I think everybody's best looks different. You know, I had an English teacher who, uh, when I was in school, I hated English. And she knew I hated English. And she didn't care. Like, but she saw me, and I would have did anything for her, not because I liked her class, but because I liked her. Yeah. Because I knew that she, she saw me and she respected me, even though she knew I hated her class. Yeah. I mean, I hated her material. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hate her, yeah. you know? Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, I think that's interesting because because what you're helping us understand, Ashanti, is the meaning of safe space. Right. So that it's not just saying, which I I've done in the past before, mistakenly, of just saying, okay, now this is a safe space, you know, and assuming the kids are going to say, okay, sure. <laughs> um, but that whole sense of the importance for you when you were seen by your teacher that that creates a safe space. She was not probably intending to create a safe space, but it does that in that relationship, if you wanna comment on that. And I think it's, you have to be intentional about it. I think you have to be intentional to say, this is a space where I'm just gonna be human with you. Yeah. I think most times teachers don't, are not seen as human by students. They see you in the grocery store, they're like, whoa, you shop? Yeah. They're like, what happened? <laughs> right? You're like, I'm a human, right? <laughs> because they only see you in that one building. But if you let, my students knew, you know, hey, some days are good, some days are not. But, and my job is not to spill all my stuff on them, but say, hey, I'm human. Today I'm having a rough morning, so I need you to work with me, right? But if I'm always trying to pretend like I'm great and I know all the answers, then they're like, well, how can we ever identify with you when you never make any mistakes? You never have any problems, yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Exactly. And I think those are the challenges our young men sometimes face, trying to connect to adults who never let them see that they're really human, that they're sometimes robotic in their connection. Yeah, okay, good. Um, we are we're a little out of time, but I want to make sure everybody gets exactly the right time equal to each other. So if you, if you want to just quickly add a couple th thoughts about the reception of the masculine, and you, you play a central role in that film. Um, and I assume you've been probably inundated with interest, given that you sort of a star of that film. So do you want to have any c comments or just quickly things that you want to say? Um, I just encourage, if you haven't seen it, please watch it. If you, if you have a son, if you teach the young men, if you ever interact with a man in your life, I encourage you to watch the documentary. Um, I think it's really powerful. I think what we know is that um, the, the information in that documentary is really helping us recognize that our boys need more than just hoping that they're going to figure it out by just because. Like it, it takes nurturing, and I think that we've been nurturing feelings and kind of caring out of them. Our prisons are full of men. Our prisons are 2.4 million people in prison. 94% of people are men. I don't think men are that much that bad, but we <laughs> teach men things when they're boys, don't show any feelings, suck it up, be tough, never show you how you feel. And then we wonder why they can be adults and we create chaos and tragedy in their communities because we taught them when they were little, don't show any feelings. Yeah. And so I think that it's naive to believe that they should know how to show feelings if they've never been taught and they've never been given permission to do it. And I think uh, that's something we have to work on as a society. And, and the documentary just has been really powerful, a tool just to get the message out in a really good way. Yeah, and I always say if we raise boys to go against their nature, why are we surprised when they grow up and act crazy? Yeah, right? yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much. That was wonderful, all three of you. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful. So we are right now ready for your questions. I'm going to read uh, the questions, and then I'm going to start with Ashanti gets to answer, and we're going to try to each answer. I think we're going to have three questions. Is that right? Uh, how can we bring an intersectional lens of race and maleness to our work? Ashanti, you start. Mm. So, I, so I never get to not think about race and maleness, right? So I, I, I don't know how to, it's really hard to think about how to tell somebody else how to think about it when they I mean I experience it. And so um, I think I do a lot of asking questions. I think what I, when I work with other teachers, I'm like, ask questions. I, I never assume, I try not to assume anything. I try to like let young people speak from their perspective and I try and take it in even if I don't understand it. I try and just be a listener and I try and say, you know, can you explain that a little bit more or I just need to listen and I, need to, I don't have a response right now. I, I just, I thank you for sharing what your thoughts are. I think one thing we have to do with definitely young men of, of in my experience, young men of color in, in my work is that um, they don't want to be told how to think. Yeah. You know, I think if you ask them their opinion, let that be their opinion. And, and then to change, try and change their opinion, or you ask them what they think about something and then you revolt their, 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 their thoughts about it, it really 
degrades and differently diminishes the, the thoughts. And so I think just being able to ask more questions, be more curious. I tell, I think there's a, a, some books say, be more curious than, than your idea of being creative. And I think that's what I try and help educators think about. If you can just be curious, then young people will tell you what they want you to know. And if you don't understand, ask more questions. And so I think that's, for me, yeah. what I've always wanted educators to do. I, I, I rarely had educators of color. So when I finally had one, you were like, you didn't have to explain a lot of stuff. You're like, oh, you get it, mm -hmm. you know? But other teachers, you have to explain, and they don't agree it. You don't, they don't agree. And so I had to, like, re-explain my explanation. And so that's one thing I think that was helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, we're a little yeah. bit on a time crunch, so just... Oh, okay, I will be yeah. Yeah. economical with my language. Yeah. Um, I suppose, you know, back to Emily Stiles, who developed this idea of windows and mirrors, she writes about something called the believing game, which is, it's, um, basically means believe that somebody else's experience is different from your own, which can be really hard to, to truly understand. And what I have found um, when my students use language about the believing game it has helped them understand that the experience of a black boy in my class is different from the experience of a white boy in my class. And sentences like, I believe that you experienced X in a different way from the way I experienced X has really helped um, them celebrate what is the same, yes, but also what is different. Yeah. And, and that language has helped us tackle that intersectionality. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about that um, in terms of my work that you know, I'm a scholar of men and masculinities, um, IES, not Y, and that's a change in how we talk about kind of what it means to be a man, and I think that I always start by saying that there are different ways of being a man um, based on who you are and where you come from, and I think we often have to kind of put that out there, because if not, we have this monolithic idea that masculinity is all that exists, yeah. that there's this dominant form, and instead you have to kind of say, we all know the dominant form, right? but very few of us actually subscribe to it. Hmm. And so there's permission given and kind of saying, help me understand who you are based on what you bring to the table. Hmm. So I have, uh, this is also a question that's at the heart of my work for the last 30 years. So um, basically, uh, we have a tendency in American culture to see black boys only having race and white boys only having gender. Yep. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm always fighting with is that black boys have masculinity <laughs> to deal with and white boys have race. So the always playing with the notions of the way we stereotype and then constrain it to one experience versus the other. So in the listening project, when we ask questions of each other that say, what do you want, what most want in your life? What do you fear the most? What happens is that divides, racial divides, gender divides, sexuality divides, all sorts of divides that happen in the classroom start to come apart because they all of a sudden look at the person who looks very different from them and say, oh my God, we both fear the same thing. Um, and so a connection is a little bit what Ashanti said, connection is formed. And we haven't even brought up the, the, the topic of race yet. Uh, we will, but we haven't yet. But they all of a sudden see a commonality. Once you understand commonalities, that's the trick, Ashanti, uh, and you know this already from your work. You got to recognize a commonality before you can talk about difference, because otherwise, if you just talk about difference, then it becomes you're entirely different from me, Ashanti, uh, because you look different from me. But if you right. start from we, we both fear the same exact thing, but tell me about how your experiences are, are going to be different from mine. I can hear you differently, right? right? Uh, so that whole notion of commonality in order to talk about difference, not to not talk about difference. That's the key thing. It's not about let's hold hands and pretend there's no difference. Let's understand our commonalities so then we can talk about difference. Okay, question one. Question two. If I could do one thing tomorrow, what should I do? Ashanti, go. Um, I would say you could do it today. You could take that card, um, you can make your mask, you can put it in the box in the town hall, <laughs> or you can hand it to Janelli here, hand it to me, and you can take this tool, which is a free resource for educators, and share it with your community. You can tweet it, Facebook it, Snapchat it, you can throw it up, in, however you get word out to your community, smoke signal it, but if we give people a chance to explore that there's more to you, more to me, more to us, than you would ever be able to see by looking at me, then we can, con we can connect, we can build a connection. Okay. And that we ask that you help us get the word out. We've collected over 39,000 masks and we need your help to hit our goal of 100,000, but even more so to build connection and community with all of us and our young people. That's it. Yeah. Um, well, for the educators here, I would say when you get back to your classroom on Monday, to really take a, a cue from Ashanti, what you said earlier really moved me, this idea that 
we have to model vulnerability. You know, we can't expect students to take risks if, if we don't. And I think sometimes in classrooms, there's this real push towards objectivity, whatever that means. And teachers feel pressure to separate themselves from the content that they teach or, you know, um, and that is inauthentic and students can sense that. So I would say that if you are a teacher in an appropriate way, when you are modeling writing or if you are creating a map of your heart, all the sorts of things that teachers do to help students um, dream up ideas for writing, tell the truth, you know, share about an authentic worry or a real hope or um, a, a, a funny little quirk about yourself. Um, because if you do that, uh, students will follow your example. Um. Oh. I'm thinking that if you're a teacher or you're an administrator of some type, one of the best things you can do, I think, is go back and take a look at your schools and have a proactive kind of discussion or assessment about not the problems the boys are having in your schools, but instead, where are the safe spaces, the pro-social spaces, where your boys in your school are finding connection, and really think kind of what is happening in those spaces, right? And how do we recreate more of those across your whole school so schools don't feel like these isolating places where boys have to wear masks all the time.